Whoever serves me must follow me, says the Lord. Where I am, there also will be my servant. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Some Greeks who had come to worship at the Passover feast came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has now come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Amen, amen, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will preserve it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there also will be my servant. The Father will honor whoever serves me. I am troubled now, yet what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? But it was for this purpose that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd there heard it and said it was thunder, but others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice did not come for my sake, but for yours. Now is the time of judgment on this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. He said this indicating the kind of death he would die. The Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The most succinct phrase that summarizes the relationship that God has with us is, I am your God, you are my people. Tighter than that, you can't describe it. And that phrase was given to us through the prophet Jeremiah and his inspiration from God. The people of Israel at this point were in Babylon. Their temple had been destroyed, they were rooted out of the Holy Land, and they were in exile. Jeremiah told the people, you keep breaking covenant with God and you're going to go downhill. Others will come and take our temple. But if you keep covenant with God, you're building an everlasting relationship. What Jeremiah does in his inspiration is have a vision from God that tells him basically where the people are. He had brought them out of Egypt into the promised land, helped them establish through various kings their kingdom, their temple, a place where they could meet God through worship and through prayer, observing the covenant, the code of the Ten Commandments. That was their connection. And the summary of that code is, I am your God and you are my people. And that code was written originally on stone, but venerated in the temple, in the Holy of Holies in a very special arc. Well, the code was written on stone, 
but wasn't to be kept on stone. The Ten Commandments, Decalogue we call it, was meant to be a contract between the people of Israel and God. As they kept the Ten Commandments, the echo of I am your God and you are my people echoed in their behavior. However, time and time again, their behavior strayed from God and strayed from the covenant. There are various theologies as to which was the greatest of the sins that the people of Israel committed. But the first commandment is the key, I think, in many ways. Idolatry. You see, the people of Israel weren't isolated. They weren't living in a bubble. They knew other tribes and other nations. And the other tribes and other nations had many gods. And they had statues of gods that they could worship. And time and time again, the Israelites wanted, I want one of those, they would say. And sometimes the intermarriage of the king who was supposed to be dedicated to God only and the Israelites only. They intermarried with these other tribes. So very often the queens would set up their temples of their gods in the sacred temple. Idolatry is probably the biggest sin. And you, we say today, oh, good thing there's no idolatry in our world and to myself and anyone who thinks that I would say think again the idolatry in today's world is far more significant than a statue the idolatry in our world breaks all of the commandments the family values sexuality relationships with people, justice, all of the Ten Commandments are challenged so often today in our world by the idolatry of our world, worshiping power, money over people. So we have that as the basis of today's readings on the fifth Sunday of Lent, Yes, it's St. Patrick's Day, according to the calendar. Happy St. Patrick's Day to all of you who commemorate it. But the significance of this day is that now the hour has come, Jesus says in the Gospel. As we move toward Good Friday, Holy Thursday, and the Easter Vigil, toward the summary of the life of Jesus, we hear him say, as these Greeks are brought to him by his apostles, now the hour has come. Now John, the author of the gospel, has so many poetic capabilities woven into his presentation of the gospel. And he even says, when Jesus said, now is the time for the Son of Man to be raised up, he puts like in a parenthesis that indicated the kind of death he was to have. And John does that consistently through his gospel. So when these people come to Jesus, something happens in Jesus. He gets a sign from the Father, the Holy Spirit, I don't quite know. But he says when these outsiders come to him, which is a very significant event, since he's not only here for the Jews, he's here for the Greeks and the outside world, including us. When they come seeking him, he realizes that's it. The hour has come. And he, and he, he goes through a personal anxiety, I think, when he says, I'm troubled now. Again, it's out of earshot. We don't see what happens, what's going on inside of him. But he realizes when these outsiders come to him, it seems that he's destined to take up the cross.
that it's moving closer and closer. And when he says, what should I do? Save me from this hour? This is very important. Jesus saying out loud, should I ask God to spare me? Now, the scriptures are our readings. The scriptures are our words. They were written and preserved for you and me. And when we are challenged in our faith, whether it's illness or whether through anxiety or whether it's through depression or whether it's through anger, do we say, I'm troubled, God, but what should I do? Ask you to spare me from this hour? And regrettably, we do say that. We, we do hit it with a why me? Why am I going through this? Why is my family suffering? Why is there no peace in the world? Why are, are you allowing the Russians to bomb the Ukraine? Why are you allowing the, the Jews and the Arabs in the Holy Land to blow up each other? And we challenge God. Very human to do that. Very human. And Jesus said the same thing. And he said, save me from this hour. And the Father responds. And if you and I sit in prayer, we'll hear the Father's voice. Not necessarily in our ears, but we'll hear the Father's voice and what the Father is saying to us when we are challenged in our own lives. Get me out of this, God? Spare me? Or, as Jesus will eventually say, your will be done. And he heard the Father's voice. They thought it was thunder. They thought it was an angel. But what did the Father say? Now is the time for glory. When Jesus is raised up, it's the time for glory. Specifically in John's Gospel, he brings the relationship of the crucifixion and the glorification of Jesus together. So when we look at the cross, the crucifix, not just the cross, the crucifix with the body of Jesus on it, we as Catholics look at that as a sign of glory. That he made it over from his humanity into his divinity. That was further exemplified at his resurrection. The Father is with him. And as the Father is with him, he is with us. And as God said to Jeremiah, I'm going to write my covenant in their hearts. Forget stone tablets. Eventually, he sends us his covenant, his greatest covenant, his own son. And when we embrace the Son, when we embrace Jesus, we are doing what Jeremiah was told by God. He is being written on our hearts. The relationship between us and Jesus is so tight, so intimate. His is the new covenant. His is the word. And when we follow him from baptism to present day and we keep him in our heart, we are covenanted to God. As we move toward the Triduum, the most sacred days of the Catholic calendar, it looks bad. The bloody Jesus it looks terrible, the crowned with thorns, Jesus. 
And if we were there at the cross with his mother, we can't imagine the anxiety she was going through. But we recall God saying, I am your God, you are my people. It's summarized in Jesus. It's most clearly in Jesus, the covenant of God. And we are invited, as Jeremiah was invited, to have it written on our hearts. We're baptized Christians. It was written on our hearts from the moment the water fell on our heads. It was reiterated in our hearts when we received the sacrament of confirmation. It's further reiterated in our hearts every time we receive the Eucharist, the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And we can hear in our ears, in our echoes, in our hearts, I am your God, you are my people. I have written my law on your hearts. And my law is Jesus Christ. And he is the one who will give us strength. So we can shout out to God, what should we say, spare us God? Or remind us what our responsibility is as Christians to work for peace, to understand forgiveness, to understand the discrepancy between prejudice and hate and our faith. His law is written on our hearts. Keep Jesus there. We have to be challenged every day sometimes to remind ourselves, I need to keep Jesus in my heart. Or what should I say, spare me God, take away anything that bothers me, no. When he was lifted up on that cross, we received the saving blood of Jesus Christ. And he drew all of us to himself. What a consolation that is. What a strengthening experience that is. As long as I keep Jesus in my heart, I'm remembering that God is my God and I am a member of God's people.